Equity Center, Ford, our book partner, Amazon.in, uh, beverage partner, Coca-Cola, Public Diplomacy, Tourism partner, Rajasthan Tourism, Amity University, UN Women, the Glenn Levitt, Data partner, MTS, Patrika Group, Hindustan Times, DNA, Dainik Bhaskar, Radio Mirchi, Ambit, Arts and Culture of Meghalaya, Aga Khan Foundation, Jan Mikalski Foundation, IQ, Penguin Random House, YPO, WPO, our venue partner, Diggi, uh, Rambak Palace, Le Meridian, uh, Clark Samer, Fortis, Kaizunga, Royal Treasure, Kingfisher, ITC Hotel, and the Obroy. Uh, before we start the session, I would request everyone to keep the aisles free. It's for your own safety. Uh, flash photography is prohibited. Uh, it's a no smoking zone. There are very few designate, designated uh, smoking zones. You can smoke there. Uh, please keep your self uh, mobile phones on silent. If you need to attend a call, you can do that outside the venue. If you want to tweet, you can do that using hashtag ZJLF or tag uh, ZJPurLitFess. In case of any emergency, uh, please remain calm and the exits are that way. The full uh, festival program book is available for sale uh, at INR 100 at the information desk. It's also a collector's item. So yeah, let's start off with today's session, which is Selfie, the Art of Memoir. Uh, let's welcome Angie Min, Mark Gevizer, Bridget Kenan, Joanna Rakoff, in conversation with Bashrat Peer. Let's have them on stage. First young men, the pioneers, the aviators, building super highways in an unknown sky, leaving wives and children in their snug homes with just a kiss and a promise to return. Roaring into the club. We're living the same life. Yes. Oh, no. oh. Uh, good morning. Uh, uh, thank you for showing up at uh, such an early hour. I, I generally don't manage to get to a panel at 10 a.m. unless I have to speak. So thanks again for coming here. We have a, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really thrilled to be part of this panel with such wonderful authors uh, who have written about such different, uh, such different stories and such different experiences of the world. Selfie, uh, <laughs> the uh, art of memoir. Well, you know, we're, we're stuck with the selfie part for the moment. Uh, you know, these are the titles we get. But uh, the art of memoir is much older than the smartphone and, uh, and, and has uh, far greater variations than any technology company can come up with that I'm absolutely certain about. And uh, often, you know, Growing up in South Asia, the idea of a memoir was generally uh, a retired bureaucrat or a politician who has lost too many elections and is utterly irrelevant and uh, <laughs> really has nothing much to do. And then he would write a book which would be, actually, they won't use the word memoir, they would say autobiography. 
But that's where we kind of got uh, the idea of what a memo was, these utterly boring people who have nothing much to do, <laughs> who just gas around and now write about what happened to them at some point. And uh, I, I never thought this would happen to me when I was 29 and 30. So I, I was basically done with living by then, I guess. So, and then I realized, you know, memoirs can be done differently and it's, it, you don't have to be powerful or, you know, irrelevant or a politician or a bureaucrat, but that it, a memoir can be about anything. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a piece of, it reflects a part of your life and it can reflect any part of your life. And often people think that if you have read a memoir by a person, you also know the person. It's, it's actually only about, a, it, it could be about certain themes and have nothing else to do with your other lives and, and large chunks of your life. Uh, but it is a very immediate, personal and powerful form uh, that, that allows us to look into you know, how, how different lives are lived and the kind of experiences people around the globe have had. Some are sad, some are funny, some are outrageous and some are very brave and and those are and, and we have we have the the, the authors here bridget keenan and she may join mark you Give see it Give it sorry, <laughs> I, I, I knew i would get that too. I'll, I'll mess that up uh, they come from different cultural backgrounds have written very different books but we are united by this idea of the memoir so i would uh, i would open with this question to all of you why memoir and oh. what is memoir for you? Well, my memoir was um, from diaries. And I kept the diaries uh, for two reasons. One is that I fell in love with a young diplomat. I was a journalist on the Sunday Times in London, and I was very young. I was once called a young meteor. But then I fell in love with this um, <laughs> diplomat, and I became a fallen star. Because the one thing about being a diplomat's wife is you're not allowed to do journalism about the country that you're in, in case it causes trouble. And you're not really allowed to do a job because you have to pay tax and then that's a complication with the embassy and so on and so on. And so I did various things, including I once volunteered for a medical clinic in Delhi. It was run by the diplomatic wives. And in those days, it was a very small clinic, but now it's actually a huge and successful enterprise. But I went into this clinic and I was alone. I think the woman that ran the clinic was away that day. And two men came in and uh, the older man was groaning and showing me a place at the back of his neck that was hurting. So I took a big plaster and put it on it. And then suddenly the younger man stepped forward and lifted up his hair. And there was nothing on the old man's neck, but on the younger man's neck, there was a huge boil. And I realized I'd put the plaster on the wrong man. So I peeled it off. I couldn't find any other plasters. So I peeled it off and stuck it on the young man. And everybody seemed to be happy, except me, who decided I wasn't going to do that kind of thing. So I started writing a diary. That's the story of my diary. <laughs> And, Instead, because that did less damage, I thought. <laughs> uh, a a follow-up question. And, and why the diary form? And, and when, when you set to turning the diary into the books, uh, you know, diplomatic baggage, your first memoir, then packing up, which is, again, a continuation of that story. Uh, well, it's, I started What diary... was it like looking at those diaries and then to turn them into a text, uh, a, a book? Well, the diary, I started the diary in 1975, and it wasn't a diary written in a book. It was just the sort of randomness of things that happened. So weird things would happen every day, every week. I don't know, my family seems to attract weird things. <laughs> and so every time a weird thing happened, I would get a bit of paper and write it down. So my diary wasn't really a book. It was a plastic bag full of bits of paper with things written on them. <laughs> and then... <coughs> talk about the randomness of life. So I was in Delhi. No, I was just, just before I went to Delhi, I was at home and I wanted to wax my moustache because uh, I have a sort of blonde moustache. And I didn't have time to go to a beauty salon, so I thought I'd do it at home. And so I got a little kit and smeared the wax on my lip. And then I ripped the wax off and I ripped off not just the moustache, but the, all the skin on my upper lip. And this then went into a sort of hard brown scab so that I looked a bit like Hitler. And um, at that exact moment, 
I had to meet an editor that I was hoping was going to give me some work. She was the editor of the Telegraph magazine in England. And so when I turned up for the appointment, she said, my God, what have you done to yourself? So I told her the whole story, kind of as I'd written it on a bit of paper in my diary plastic bag. And she said, will you go, I said, I'm just going to India. And she said, well, go to India and write, the, write a story for me on how you did this to your lip. So I did that, and it appeared in the magazine. And then in England, the humorous magazine Punch asked me to write a column from India because they read the piece in the Telegraph. Um, this is the random, I mean, I hadn't damaged my lip by waxing the moustache. I wouldn't have had the question from the editor. I wouldn't have done the piece. And Punch would not have seen the piece. So I did, for about a year and a half, I did a column from Delhi called Blubbings of a Memsab. And it <laughs> basically put in all the weird things that happened to me. And um, that eventually led to uh, the, the whole thing being published in a book. Well, thanks, so That's me. <laughs> And a story very different from that. And she mean, the novelist, she's, she's written uh, six novels who have dealt with like really important and powerful figures in Chinese, in Chinese history. And her first book was read as a Leah, if I say it, uh, a really powerful memoir of her growing up in China in the aftermath of uh, the Cultural Revolution. And, and the most uh, recent, which she wrote many years later after that, was uh, almost 20 years uh, after the first memoir came, was the second part when she, as, as a young woman, she moved to, uh, uh, from Shanghai to, to, the, uh, to Chicago to study art and, and essentially immigrated. It was an, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those stories which uh, when, when all the cliches one has about the, the good cliches one has about the United States, and especially some of the cities we love, New York and then Chicago, do come true when, when a young person can escape a really difficult life and get a second chance, that the, the immigrant's dream that, that works and succeeds despite you know, rising xenophobia around us in the world. The, these are stories which just still remind, remind us of, you know, of, of somewhat better times in those contexts. And, I, I, you, I mean, you know, she did, when she arrived in the United States, she, she really didn't, couldn't speak English because she, she came from a different culture and not with an English education. But she taught herself, I mean, at the end of the day, Conrad couldn't speak, didn't know English too, either till he was 19 or, or in, in a closer context, our friend Nadeem Aslam, he didn't know any English till he was 19. But it's a language you teach it yourself. And, and to master it in a short span and to create a corpus of books, it's, it's always a remarkable feat. So with that, I want to tell you, how, I mean, uh, how did you turn to the form of memoir? Why was, I mean, you, you're a very accomplished novelist, but why was the first one a memoir? Or, or, and, or, and the need to sort of return to that story now, 20 years later, why this form? I have no idea. <laughs> Um, Chinese, uh, uh, Chinese um, critics um, had a really issue with me and they say why can't you write something that represents the elite Chinese like a 5%. Mm -hmm. We have good things about trying to show. Why do you, I mean China's image is as bad as it is. Um, why do you have to, I don't know if it's, if it's even decent to, to translate that. Basically it says taking off your pants to get you know, insulted by the Western. Um, my answer was, well I happen to be the, representing the 95% of the majority, That's grassroots right. Chinese. And what got me started writing Red Azalea was this image of my comrade at the labor camp, Little Green, whom I was the person who identified her body. Um, she drowned. And I, when I was in, the, in America, was enough, um, I would survive on seven packs of noodles a day, and I just constantly, the image was like, a, you know, 
when I went down the bridge and the boatman got her and asked me to identify her, he flipped her over like an egg roll on a skeleton, just flip her. And she used to be so beautiful and now after three days soaking in the water right. and the face is like, look like a pumpkin. Uh, I couldn't get away from it. So, I mean, some of our, uh, you know, some of the people here m might not have read the book. Uh, <laughs> Let's let's give them a backdrop. It uh, you were in a labor camp, and that's yeah. It's one of the things. One of the things when you were you were six, seven, 16 or seventeen. Yeah. like everybody was sent there because the Cultural Revolution to, was causing right. chaos. Why was about, everybody sent there? Like, just well, the, yeah, because the, the Red Guards went out of out of hand, yes. out of control. Mao says, let's migrate them to the countryside. So one third of Chinese goes. If I didn't go, uh, the drums would be beat and from my door until I go, or my family, my, my sister, siblings will not get jobs right. until you, 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 you just go. Um, it's a Chinese way, you know, just to push you. And, and I how went long there, were you there? In the, after middle school, I was like three years. Um, and the other thing was, um, the other um, thing happened in the, in, in, in the labor camp that I, I just couldn't let go was the relationship. Cause the, we had 100, over 100,000 youth around East China Sea in the 10 labor camps, aged from 17 to 25. And, and it, only labor, no, um, you, can't, you, can't, you can't date. Right. The price for love is, for the best is a public denunciation, humiliation, and the worst, you can be a bullet in the, in the, in the head, and that costs you 26 cents. Uh, and they were sent to the family to, you know, it's called kill the hand to shock the monkeys. So I w we would, as um, homo fledging youth, would, you know, stay in the lot. And uh, I was right now, a lot of people ask me, are you, are you homosexual, are you, you, you're bisexual, and all that. I, I had no idea. I would say that my, my, my the girl, the female comrade I became friends with, she was, um, in love with a man, young man in, from different company. And um, she, she, they, sent, they sent letters. So I, I volunteered to, to deliver the letters, letters, go between. And then one day the man got so afraid because you know, it's, it's, a, it's a punishment that so mm -hmm. can ruin your, the rest of your life. So he w would not send the letter back. So I will come back empty handed to my girlfriend, and uh, I, I hated to disappoint her. And then I keep, she keeps sending me over, and I start to tell a story when I come back about how he told me that he loved, he right. loved her. And then, of course, that got her emotionally escalated, and she wanted me to send more, and I come back and was really get, get to the point that she's so passionate, and then and, and I had to play the boyfriend. So oh. I, to, to kiss her, to deliver the affection. And of course, I was 18, she was 22. And, and through the kiss, and I think of myself, you know, first time experience the human connection. Because right. in the, in our time grow up, right. um, the school is all about loyalty to Mao. And the only book, I remember that, because the red got looted from a, on, on the street, and I picked it up, it was called um, From Head to Toe, Looking from a Monkey's Eyes. And it was the first time I saw, you know, it's like a medical illustration right. kind of thing. And there's a one sentence really got my attention. I was 16 years old. Um, it was saying that the highest form um, of comradeship uh, that the intercourse was highest form Com of revolutionary comradeship. Comrade. So that was about the, the knowledge of sex that right. we know. But anyway, um, so... So what, what happened with your friend then? You mentioned the body. Well, no, she, she's a different, she's my commander. She's so commander. I have the, the body was my, my girlfriend and my, my other, other command, uh, the comrade, a little grain. And this is the yen. So it's, it's, a, it's just carry out everything in the, in the mosquito net and risking right. everything. So I think uh, by accident, I, um, I understand the uh, poetry of right. God. Okay. 
So three years in really difficult conditions uh, in a labor camp. And then somehow you ended up in Shanghai in a, as, as an actor in, a, in Madame Mao's propaganda studio. Uh, how did that happen? Well, um, it was close to 1976. At the beginning, Mao was dying and nobody, nobody knew. And Madame Mao was the only person, and she planned to take over China to become the next, next president of China. And she needs to make a propaganda movie, it's like a campaign movie, to pave the way featuring a heroine. And she right. secretly sent the talent scouts all over China to look for this correct looking face. And I was hoeing uh, weeds in the cotton field in the labor camp in Ch East China Sea. And um, one day, um, I just, um, my, my injured back from carrying manure make me way slower. And I, I wasn't allowed to eat because you, you, you have to finish your quota. So I saw this white van. In, in labor camp, we don't have a secret tree, not even a tree. So a white van appeared on the horizon and they approached us. And uh, a group of men and women in the Green Army long coat and right. buy the dress and we know they're important. Right. So they come walk to us and they scan everybody. And um, they, everybody stopped because they thought, you know, just look at something, something interesting. And I, th I thought to myself, it's my time I be able to have dinner tonight. So right. I hoeing like a crazy. Oh. So from their point of view, I was the only moving pro object on the horizon. That was how I spot was spotted. Wow. And they came after, uh, asked me, um, they kind of, you know, they're going like this, measure right. me with their eyes, um, my height, and they talked to me in Mandarin, and barely, I speak Shanghai dialect, I didn't speak right. Mandarin. So I gave them the in direction to the headquarter. I said, turn right, but they end up turning left. That was kind of odd. Uh, two li weeks later, I got a order to report to the Shanghai Film Studio, and uh, first uh, they took me to the, on the tractor, and then the military truck to right. Shanghai to be tested. And it was there I met hundreds of beautiful women that we look alike. Ah. So there was another six times comp comp competition. Right. Mm. And uh, it, it, it's kind of odd uh, because I... Um, Did you act in one of the films? I, I, I don't, I, I didn't know how, that was the reason, because I didn't know how to act. Because ah. anybody who knows how to act were eliminated, because there's a sign of a uh, bourgeois, bourgeois background. background. You, yeah. you have a cultural background, the family. Right. And the only thing I, they asked me, what do you know? And I knew was to recite Mao poems, Mao quotations. Because that was the way that I get, get away from the bullies who beat me. Because right. every time you start, I start, they, they won't stop until I start reciting Mao quotations. So, so I get so good, so I start to really loud um, and, and, and then just recite it. And many years later, it helped me to get an American visa that way. That's wonderful. Um, it's, 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 it's a different, it's a I can just, you know, I go, um, in a very, have you, have you seen like a Chinese poetry reciting? It's, it's a really stylish, and it's like, a, I, I send you the, I, I cite you the last, last sentence. <laughs> so that's my poems. And that's what got you out. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, on my right is Joanna Rakov, a journalist, edit, writer, editor, publisher. She's had many roles. Uh, and. Uh, here in a, in a, in a particular, for a particular book of hers called My Selinger Years. And in, in it's, it's a beautiful book about the world of... Oh. Well, They're giving you music. They're giving you music, Joanne. <laughs> you have to it's sing your reply. Okay, it's a cue. <laughs> Hopefully I'm to... not supposed to dance. <laughs> okay. uh, so your, your, your memoir, uh, my my Selinger is is about you as a young young person in a literary agency, uh, um, in a rather quaint literary agency, and also a very uh, a very well known legendary literary agency in New York, uh, where uh, among the clients was the great Selinger, and one of the parts of your job 
as the book tells us, was to respond to Selinger's fan mail. When did you decide to write? I mean, you know, it's, it, when I read the book, it, it, it was a world very familiar and yet, you know, it kind of a reminder of a, it, it was like, the, it was a much older New York, although the, the story is set in a more recent time. Right. And, and, and the changes in publishing that all, you know, it's, those, those cultures are disappearing. I mean, the corporatization, corporatization of both the agency and the publishing house. I mean, there's still young people working for very little, but that's, that's maybe one of the few similarities. When did you decide to write about it in the way of, it's almost like looking at a world ceasing to exist and, and to write about it. When did you, when did you come across? Yeah, that's true. And that's, um, to work backwards, what right. you just said, um, this kind of um, portrayal of a world that's actually sort of about to disappear um, is, is what um, pushed me over the edge into agreeing to write the book. So, um, so I'm actually really, I think of myself as a novelist. Um, my, first, my first book is a novel called A Fortunate Age. It's also about a world that's changing. It takes place during the dot-com boom. And I um, was a person who, um, before I published that book, I mainly made a living as a books journalist, a book critic, um, sort of a cultural journalist. And I was adamantly against memoir. I had no interest in memoir. Um, all, all memoir possibilities struck me as not interesting, like the sort of grand man, grand woman looking back on his or her life and usually manufacturing grander things than ever happened to him or her. And, or you know, erasing the sort of terrible things that happened. That was boring to me. And then the kind of new form of memoir that became very popular, in the States at least, in the late 1990s, um, like with books like Mary Carr's The Liars Club and what kind of, that kind of thing, right. that I was extremely uninterested and you know, you know, annoyed by it. Um, because I felt that there was this artifice to it that um, I, I attempted to read some of the very popular memoirs um, in the late 90s and early aughts. And they felt so manufactured to me because you know you would, I would read one and it, there would, it would start in the writer's childhood and there would be all this dialogue you know from say when the author was four you know and my mother said this and my father said this and I thought what that's not what they really said you're making this up and I somehow in my ide idealistic youth thought that that was ridiculous and I thought why why didn't this person who wrote this book that sold millions of copies simply write this as a novel. And then I could accept that this was made up. So right. anyway, so at some point during my annoyedness with the memoir, I, um, I, I wrote essays about, about my life um, for magazines. And I wrote an essay about um, working at this literary agency, which I, I did in 1996. Um, and that was very much focused on answering Salinger's fan mail. That was really the, the focus of it. But there was stuff about this agency, which was, um, as you mentioned, right. um, a very strange place. So just to set the scene, in 1996, this agency um, was in no way digital. So in New York, in the publishing industry, you know, every, pretty much every office was completely computerized. You had voicemail. Um, everything was done by email. Mm. And this particular office, um, was, you know, sort of stuck in approximately maybe 1959. Um, you had giant typewriters that were about 30, 35 years old when I first started working there. A receptionist who sat out front, you know, and answered the phone. And if the phone rang when she wasn't there, nobody answered it. It just rang and rang. You just couldn't get through. And so it was, it was a very archaic sort of place. And um, you, know, all, you were paid by a check that was written out by hand. Um, so anyway, so I, um, at a certain point, I wrote this essay for a glossy magazine about answering Salinger's fan mail. And I, being slightly dim-witted, didn't, it didn't occur to me that this would get a lot of attention, that people, you know, Salinger was such a recluse that people right. were interested in sort of anything, anything about, about him. And so I was interviewed for a lot of newspapers, and I was a little bit freaked out by this. And then editors and agents started calling me and saying, would you turn this into a book? And I was completely shocked by this, because I thought, this is just this little story about me when I was 23. I was about 29 when I wrote it. And I thought, right. who cares? This is just this little story about my life. Why would this be a book that's ridiculous? I was, I was, I, I, not only I couldn't I believe it, right. but I thought it was absurd. And I was working on a novel. So right. years went by, and the form of memoir, it, um, 
you changed. It really it did. And memoir yeah. became something different. And I started reading memoir that I loved. What memoir did, that uh, was more novelistic. One of the things, did the, 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 the initial hesitation about how can these, can these people make this up in a memoir? Yeah, the How did you deal with it. that question, with the, with, well, the, with the dialogue part from childhood? Can we really have that? How did you deal with that? Yeah. Or like, you know, a, a scene or a memory when you walked into that office and somebody mentioned Jerry. So in, in the writing of the memoir, and, and uh, as, as journalists trained in the American tradition, how, how do you deal with that? Can we put something in quotes if we, are not, if we don't have it on tape? It was very hard for me. It really was. Like I come from the same school of journalism right. that you do, and exactly. I, you know, was used to, you know, working for magazines where everything was rigorously fact-checked. You had to have, you had to turn over your transcripts, you know, everything. Right. And so, anyway, so cut to a few years ago, and um, Salinger dies. I'm asked to write a piece about answering the fan mail. I do it. It turns into a documentary, a radio documentary for the BBC, right. and then I'm asked to write a book on it. And I said no, again, for all the same reasons. Right. And then I'm asked again and again, and finally, my agent said to me, you know, I think you should do this. <laughs> Just think of it as a long magazine piece. Not a big deal. And, you know, try writing the first 20 pages. I did, and um, I'll explain more about that right. after, but, but so I agreed to do it. And when I sat down to do it, I found I just couldn't. I couldn't get past the... I, so I, I spent a full year, essentially, right. just writing, looking back on old letters, interviewing everyone I had known during that time, being a journalist, basically, right. trying to sort of get all the facts straight. I wrote hundreds of pages of simply my memories, trying to figure out, first of all, what the story was, so there was that component of it. Like, what... I wanted it to read like a novel, so I just wanted to figure out, you know, what is my story? What is my arc? Who are the characters? Because um, in right. any memoir, you know, you're kind yeah. of excising stuff, right? You only want those yes. main characters. So anyway, but the, what, I, what I also did was, because um, I was sitting at my desk in tears, unable to kind of Difficult. figure it out. And so I, I have, of course, a bunch of friends who are novelists who have written memoirs. Right. So I wrote to them and um, said, can you have coffee with me or can we talk on the phone? How did you do this? And every single one of them, I said, how did you get that dialogue you know, with your mom when you were 18 and you, know, right. you, know, you became punk rock and she yelled at you? What happened there? And everyone said to me um, the same thing. They said, you have to just, it, this is, a memoir is subjective. You just have to write down you know, what you remember. And nobody is expecting it to be journalism. They're not expecting that you had a tape recorder there when you were 11 and you broke your toe, you know, right. on your front step. They're not, no one thinks that. The memoir now is something different than it was. It, it's this kind of, it's a form in which, you know, you're expected to tell the truth, but everyone knows that there's some layer of artifice, that you're just reconstructing things from right. memory. And I, right. being like an, an impossibly naive and idealistic person, sort of was like, oh, okay. And so, that's, That's what about. I did. <laughs> but, uh, one question, because there, there's, there are at least some Selinger fans here. What was the oddest, funniest, craziest fan letter that you received uh, for him? Oh, my God. There were so many. I mean, I guess um, the ones... I'll, I'll just tell you about... The letters sort of fell into a few different categories. Right. But the ones that I loved the best were... Um, so I'll talk about a genre of letters. Of course were the letters that came from young people, from teenagers um, or people in their early 20s that were written in the voice of Holden Caulfield. Mm. So the letters that were like, Dear Jerry, you old bastard. Mm. You know? <laughs> uh, my pal Steve, my crumb, you know, he's such a crumb bun. We were out last night looking at girls. You know how girls are. Mm. You can't figure them out, but you know that kind of thing, like written in, in kind of Salinger slang, as if it were the 1940s wow. instead of the 1990s. And they were so. The thing that I loved about them was just how outrageous they were. Because you know, I was this very shy person. I couldn't imagine ever writing a letter to you know potentially the most famous living author wow. of our day in the voice of his most iconic character. And, and yet, insane. I received hundreds and hundreds of letters <laughs> that were like this. And I would sit at my desk reading them, at first with my jaw dropping open, and then 
laughing until tears <laughs> fell down my face. Not laughing at the fans, which is sort of, they were so wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. It's lovely. Uh, and Mark is uh, a journalist, writer, and even a bit of activism. And he's, he's from Johannesburg and to most recently uh, has written a wonderful memoir about race, about growing up in Johannesburg, about race, about sexuality, about politics there. Mm. I mean, again, the form of memoir that, I mean, you and I are quite um, far similar in that sense, that we are both reporters mm. who have books that are called memoirs. Mm. But that took a, and, and you used to, I mean, you used, it's more research oriented, but ours are more like, you know, field work, you go out somewhere and you have to do the yes. field interviews. They're more kind hybrid. Of, they're more hybrid. But uh, like, you know, the, it, it, I, it's not, your book is not just about your memories. I mean, one of, one of my uh, all time favorite books is, you know, Oran Malan's uh, My Traitor's Heart. Yeah. And in some ways, it's, it's in, in a similar it's tradition. It's in the same genre. It's in yeah. the same genre. It's in the same tradition. And that's one of the greatest nonfiction books in my book. I mean, you know, of, and one of the most powerful accounts of race. And, and, and you, you're, you're in the same tradition. Uh, so when did you decide to, uh, to use this model? Yeah. Or, or, or uh, how do you, and do you think this was a, I mean, your journalism has been, you know, has, has been published everywhere. I, I've read it over the years and I, I know it well. But to choose a particular form, of, of which there's a, there's a very powerful tradition in South Africa, and, and given the context of race politics and, 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 and the policy of sexuality, you know, to, to, to be a white Jewish gay writer in South Africa at this time. So why this form? So what, Bashar, what like, like you and like Joanna, I'm a, I'm a journalist and I was tra I'm trained. I'm more than trained, I'm, I, it, it's in my DNA to ask people about them, them rather than to right. talk about myself. And, and like Joanna, I have a, a, a similar, I had a similar kind of diffidence to, to the genre because I did not have the life experience of Anchi Min. Uh, no, I mean, <laughs> sort of very uh, few people can have such a... And, and it just, it, 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 it felt, it, would, it felt self-indulgent to write about myself given that I grew up a, a, in, 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 a, in a privileged and very comfortable way, in, in a society that was in flux and that was, um, that was very difficult. But my childhood was not a difficult childhood in any way. Um, I, I, I come from a, a, a coherent family as well. Um, but I guess in, in, as a journalist and then as a biographer, because I've published biography too, um, right. two things were coming to me. Uh, the first was is that the, the best way to tell a story as a journalist is to put yourself on the shoulder of someone else and right. to go through life on this person's shoulder and that way to kind of navigate through the, the, the swamp of data that is the world every time you, um, right. you encounter when you open your door and you have to report a story. Right. So, so I, I began writing specifically about um, the South African transition to democracy by telling people stories through this transition, right. from apartheid to democracy, from slavery to freedom, you know, right. these big ideas. Uh, and that, so that was the first... So when, when did you start this journey? Like, uh, you, you start... One, one question I have, I mean, I, I have a lot of South African Jewish friends who are writers, and some of whom you know. Hmm. A lot of them told me that before they became writers or journalists, you know, the, the divides were so stark that, you know, they had never seen Soweto or, or, yeah. or seen a black neighborhood. That you, you had never stepped across the well, line. Well, this, this, this is in fact the construct of my book, um, which is that w uh, I, was, I was a very nerdy kid and I was obsessed with maps. And I'm sure there are many people in, in, in this audience who had the same experience and we could form a support group. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, I, I would spend hours and hours and hours with the map book of the street map of Johannesburg playing a game where I would send an imaginary dispatcher from our house to deliver goodies to somebody else in other parts of town. And this way I got to know the city that I came from. Um, and I, the map book was never in the car when my father needed it because I, I'd taken it to my room. <laughs> so this, um, this rule was made that was very strictly enforced, which was that the map book was not allowed to leave the car. So I would spend hours of my childhood sitting in the back of my father's Mercedes, 
uh, playing this game. And the way I would play the game is I'd find a, an address in the phone book, in the telephone directory, and then send my dispatcher off with the goodies to this address. And inevitably, I came, this was in the 70s, inevitably I, I, I came across one of the few black names right. in the book, because black people, even though they were the majority, didn't have telephones or electricity. Um, and this address was in a place called Alexandra. And I knew what Alexandra was because it was where black people lived. And the black people who lived in the house and who served me, I knew that when they went off, they went to Alexandra. But it might as well have been on a different planet. Right. And, and the absolute shock that came from the Describe this game, that, visual, like viscerally, what was it like the first time? That, well, no, well, the, shock, the, shock of, the shock of finding this African name in the book right. was, was that Alexandra was on the next page of the street atlas. Literally the next page. I w we lived on page 77 and Alexandra was on page 79, but somehow I hadn't noticed it. And then the next shock after that was I could not, there was no route from my page 77 to 79. It just wasn't mapped. The route between our two worlds was right. not mapped. Now, of course, if you were black, you knew exactly how to cross that boundary because right. you had to come and work, right. but we didn't. A little bit later during the 1976 uprising, which was right. the big youth uprising, I, it, my nerdy self went to the map book to look for Soweto, and it just wasn't there. It had wasn't not there. been mapped at all. It did not exist. Wow. So, the, so the book for me, the book that I've written, and right. this is how I came to memoir, was, um, was about how I've, in my life I've tried to dispatch myself as right. a journalist, as a reporter, as a reporter, across these boundaries and, and sort of put myself in the places that, that were unmapped or that were across impossible boundaries right. as, as, as a child and, and in the process to have discovered how I live in a boundary in, in sort of in, in the frontier itself. Right. And I mean, the, you, you, you cross the frontiers of race, and, and we know that too, but there was also the frontier of the politics of sexuality. How yeah. did you negotiate that in, in pre you know, in before the freedom and well, I suppose I, 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 when this all began when I, when I found this old map book, which is a very quirky, eccentric map book in a, um, in a used bookstore, and, and I was sort of overwhelmed with nostalgia and, and, I, and as an adult, I was asking myself what the, what the cause of this nostalgia was. And I had to begin asking myself why I played this game Dispatcher in the first place. What was it that, that had me, like all of the rest of you who were obsessed with maps, why did I need to voyage to these imaginary places outside of right. the comfortable bounds of my childhood? And, and I, what I came to was, was that, um, that, that I wasn't so comfortable in the comfortable bounds of my childhood because I right. was different in another way. Right. And I was a queer kid. I was, a, I was a, quite an effeminate kid. I, was, um, I might not have been a gay kid, but I sort of grew into being a gay adolescent. Right. And, um, and I suppose one, I, I don't in, in any way mean to, um, to connect my feelings of being an outsider with the, with the experiences of, of black well, people. Well, it does give you a certain empathy. But well, there's, there's a sense of being an outsider and of, of having some kind of underground identity. Right. And, under, and, and underground is a metaphor I use in the book a lot. Because right. Johannesburg, for those of you who don't know, is, is, is built, is, it's only there because of the gold underneath it. And it, and it sort of has these, these um, physical and metaphorical layers of underground. You know, the black workers who came to Johannesburg came to work underground. underground in the tunnels, um, in the gold they, they had a, an underground identity because they were not allowed to be in the city after dark if they didn't have a pass. Right. And very interestingly, when I first heard the word closet, closet right. is an American word. We have cupboards like you do right, we and, have uh, in India. <laughs> and I, in my mind, I thought of a closet as a space underground. Wow. I didn't know a closet was a cupboard. And that, that wow. says something about the kind about of underground the identity that, exactly. and double life that I had developed as, a, as an adolescent. Mm. So, Ona, thank you so much. I mean, really, that's, that's sort of, these are such, I think we should at this point uh, open for questions. And, you know, we, we got these four wonderful stories from four different worlds, but anyone who has questions, please. Um, can I 
uh, oh, yes, ask a course. question. <laughs> um, do the rest of you have a problem with false memories? I'm just thinking, I did a journey once around the Middle East with two friends, and we all kept diaries. And the other day, 30 years after the event, we compared our diaries, having never seen each other's diaries before, and they were all completely different. You wouldn't have known we were on the same trip. And I just wonder how much you think right. we edit our memories as we write our memoirs. Well, my mother thinks I've got false memories. Yeah. <laughs> it is. Yeah. My mother thinks my memoir is fiction. <laughs> I, she saw it very differently. Uh, my, my experience was that um, it's something I thought was so uninteresting, and I, I just thought it's ridiculous to even write about it. I think uh, many of you are you come here for the mem mem art of memoir section. You probably would experience something. You, you, you're just not aware that you're so close. You're in the mountain. You can see the mountain. So right. the material you think is so uninteresting. Yes. And when you be with other people, all of a sudden this thing come memory comes to. Alive and becoming interesting, I experienced the transform, the moment, the point of transformation myself with another writer uh, named Frank McCore, oh, Angelus so Ashes. Angelus Ashes. We were on the yes. panel. Right? Uh, Angelus Ashes, right. uh, uh, McCore sits here, and right. there's an um, African American a lady from Chicago Project sitting in the middle, oh, right. and, she, and I sit here. She started talking, complaining about she only has two toilets in her apartment, it's not enough. And then McCore says, don't get me to talk about toilet. I didn't have a toilet. I have a bucket. So she said, any of you read her book, uh, his book? He talked about yes. the bucket right. on the, uh, st the, the, the staircase where they come down at night. They have to pee in the, in, in the bucket. In the middle of the night, you hear the sound, the stinks and everything about this bucket. And that really tricked me. And I said, don't have me talk about toilets. I don't even have a bucket. <laughs> I have this manure pit with a thin slice of two by four on top of it. And I, you know, we rice farmers, we plant rice, we don't wear shoes. I got on it and I go over there and uh, do my business. Now, mosquito just swarms in and, and I have to do the dance. Every one of the 10,000, 100,000 of them do, do the dance. So when you pee, <laughs> when you are peeing, you do the dance, you bait the wall of the mosquito. But when you do the big business, uh, one of these mosquitoes are bound to get you. And it's a super mosquitoes, and it bit you, it hurts, it, it's itch so bad, you can scratch it and you just lose the balance and you risk falling oh. into the pit. Oh my God. And at that moment, I turn around and the, the lady in the middle got up on the left. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. I think, good. I no, Joanna. I just wanted to say, Bridget, so I had the exact same experience as you. So in, in researching this book, you know, as I said, I, I interviewed you know, everyone that I knew during this time, yeah. including um, there is um, a, sort of, a, a sort of horrible boyfriend character okay. in the book who's known yes. as Don. And, um, and so I, who's this very sort of egotistical, narcissistic, you know, though of course impossibly insecure person. So I hadn't been in touch with him in years. And I thought, you know, I would like to talk to him and see, and just I want to let him know that he's going to be a character in the book. Um, and I want to sort of just try to, to see what his memories are of certain things. And so um, I called him and basically interviewed him. And I had already written a lot of the book by this point. It was hard to find him and hard to get a hold of him. He kind of fell a bit off the grid. And so I... Um, I, I didn't tell him what I'd already written. I just asked him questions, including the first question being, so do you remember how we met? And his memory of how we met. And so we both are people that keep journals. Part of the, part of the, uh, the plot of the book is I, he keeps his journal out, and I at one point read it, because he's, it, he's, of course, left it out for me to read. So he's written down everything in his, in his life that during that time, and so had I. And I said, how did we meet? And his story of how we met was completely different. Mm. You completely own? different. I mean, no similarity, oh. no overlap. Completely, one hundred percent different. Exactly. Than mine. So, a memory is so, 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 so subjective, tricky. and that's uh, that's what what I came to realize. My perspective completely shifted. That a memoir is just you are telling the truth yeah. as you see it. True. The Mark. other thing is, if there are any memoir writers in the audience. 
just, I mean, diary writer, write down everything that happens because you completely forget it. I mean, it's not a false memory, you just no. forget it. Yeah. So when I came to write my first book of memoirs, I was looking through all these bits of paper in the plastic bag and I kept finding things like, there was a note that said, very important, small green VIP story. <laughs> and I couldn't remember anything about a small green VIP. I mean, you'd think, obviously when I wrote yeah, it, I thought, true. this can never go out of my memory, but it did. I have no idea. Yeah. If any of you can think of anything, I'd love to hear so, it. So I, I wanted right. to say something right. about the um, relationship between journal writing and memoir writing. Right. Uh, uh, for me, um, because I try to keep a journal as well. And, and there, is, there's a, there is a kind of artifice to, to write. The, the journal is almost automatic writing, right? Yes. The diary is yes. automatic writing. This is what I did today. This is what happened. Um, this is what I'm thinking. This is what I'm feeling. Um, for me, the memoir writing, which is something I had never done before, I did this book, was the transformation of that kind of loose form right. into, into proper writing, into, into prose that I know is going to be read by yes. another. Right. And that other is, you know, you guys, people I've never yes. met before. Yes. And, and there's, there's, an, there's something you do to your personal experience. Yes. I mean, it's something I do as a reporter all the time. Right. You know, if I'm, yeah. if I'm going to blog about this, this festival, I'll do it. But, but there's something you do to your own experience right. when you turn it into this, into this construct. And you take, you take, you, f you need to find the right adjective. And you need yes. to put right. things together in a certain order. And you kind of make sense of it, but you also kind of, in making sense of it, create a, a um, it, it becomes a mythology, it becomes the story, a story of your life. So what I remember now, after I've written this memoir, is not necessarily what happened, but how I wrote about what happened. Right. Yes. And that right. Yeah, yeah. I like to, like right. to add to that. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. 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 you write add to, just to add to your point okay. about your own role, because you become a character. Yeah. Yeah. And I think yes, for me, yes. it's like a, one point to billion Chinese people who suffer through the Cultural Revolution, everybody's got a story, guess what? If every memoir come out, I'm the victim. Yeah. Right. yeah. So that was a point for my book, and the right. thing that I struggled the most, was I just the victim? Yeah. Or was I the participant? Was I greedy? Yeah. Was anything negative you know, about me, the human darkness? Mm -hmm. And I think that that was the thing that, uh, between a, um, a successful, but that means there's an element of reflection right. in, in, yes. in, this, in this making of you know, I mean, It's you, so easy to make yourself, you, have, uh, you know, you don't want to look at yourself like think that's, you know, you, you, you don't, you go through that. Because right. your first draft, you find yourself right. always, you know, you, right. you, just, you just naturally. What was it like to see your first draft, such an intense story, such a struggle to learn the language, and then you finally see yourself as this character who's in these sentences, paragraphs. How did you feel when, when, well, when you actually it, printed it out? It, it's kind of this very discouraging. You know, I feel like I you know, can't write. It's just no talent. So. No, but just to, to see the story first. I mean, this, you, see as, the story? To, to see it in that written form, out of your body, on paper, was there relief? Was there fatigue? What, what was it like once it was done? The first memoir. I, I don't think about it. I don't know. I mean, first memoir, um, I don't know. My agent called me and said, are you sitting down? I was in the middle of fixing toilet and the plumber and doing, and I do you <laughs> so want me to sit, sit down? I can sit down, but I'm sodding the pipe to do the uni. And then she says, so never mind. You know, you have a, a publishing making, a, a, it's, it's like a five, publishing, making offers. Offer. It was Wonderful. overwhelming. I, I just wanted to get a job, like your job, you know, be able to answer the phone, say, may I help you, you yeah. know, be a secretary right. to learn English, make a living. And so right. I think I wasn't, and, and write and these down, it was just um, a way to, these people haunted me, the, the characters in it, right. you know, and, and in real life, I mean, 30 years later, I'm, I've been making a living uh, as a writer for 25 years mm -hmm. and, and now the cook see the second memoir uh, i am a lot conscious and a lot tougher right. on the me character right mm. you know yeah. it, the um i am not afraid to um bring out the negative because uh, to share because i think only when i bring out myself i treat give the same treatment other chinese people from china will be able to come forward 
And I think that that's the only way we we'll avoid the cultural revolution. It's not the Chinese government is trying to ban the subject. Yes, they, out of insecurity and then concern for the stability for the society, yeah. with other reasons, the survival of very, very survival of the Communist Party itself. Sure. But I think the most thing, the weight is on the people who are who are not ready or who right. are unwilling to come and to really face and reflect what right. they have done to themselves and to humanity during right. the Cultural Revolution. Thank you so much. And we, uh, there's a queue that we have to wrap up, but I could possibly take two questions. So the lady in the front, please. Uh, and this here, on the left. Thank you. I don't know if this question will make sense. Oh. But how much do you think language, do you use language as a gateway that helps you into your psyche, your memories? And if you do acknowledge that or use it, how, how would you say you specifically use that gateway? Mm. Oh, well, for me, so much. Um, you know, I mentioned that I sort of really, really struggled to write this particular memoir. and. Um, as, as a novelist and as a journalist, I have sort of default modes and narrative tones and styles. Like in, in fiction, I, I write sort of like, um, you know, from a very sort of distant kind of force, Ian Forster-esque perspective. I'm, you know, I have lots of characters. And so to write in the first person was very difficult for me. So I had this whole year in which I was just sort of writing, almost like writing in a journal, writing down memories. And the, the memoir finally clicked into place when I was able to figure out what tone and style I wanted um, and, and how that would work in conjunction with the I, like who the I was and how that I expressed herself. And it turned out to be a much sort of more simple um, style than in my fiction or my journalism with shorter sentences, um, more direct sentences, less description. You know, um, so for me, the, it was completely tied together. And you know, I have another memoir in the works, and I think that is going to be in an, a, a rather different style because the subject matter is much more um, difficult and intense, and it needs an even more blank style. I, I had the experience of, of um, the, what I think of when, when I hear your question is, I had the experience in doing this work at times where the memory only happened once I found the language for it. Mm, yes. And yes. Um, there, there's a very, very particular, yes. uh, sp specific, the, the tra the, the, there was a very traumatic thing that happened while I was finishing this book, which is that yes. I was the subject of a, of a terrible exactly. attack in South Africa with two friends, a home invasion, guns, a rape. And um, it, it was, you know, traumatic. And um, the, the way I could get through that was by writing about it and turning this extraordinarily ugly thing into, I mean, it sounds weird, but, but, but a thing of beauty by finding the right adjective mm, to right. describe um, my fear. And by, 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 by turning this very chaotic experience into something with order and a conclusion. Right. Yes. The conclusion being that I'm here. I mean, I'm <laughs> yeah. lucky that I had that conclusion. You know, many others right. don't. But, right. um, but putting the kind of order, the structure of, of of sentences and paragraphs and, and narrative to this chaotic thing. Um, I don't know, Anshi, whether it was sim similar for you, whether... I make it really sure. Yeah. I think it's so sure. important to find your own voice, because for so many times I wanted to sound American, and I failed, because once you try to sound like everybody else, and you lose, you lose mm. your, your, your thing. Mm. So yeah. I come back, I had a process of coming back to my own language, own way of saying it, the style that makes you survive. Right. For example, I say oh, opportunity in America is for, there for everybody. Instead of saying that, I would say the sun does not hang just on one family's tree. Mm. Lovely, um, can I say something? Which is, uh, people say, when they read my books, they say, my God, it must be so easy for you to write because you write exactly as you talk. And they don't understand that this transformation from the journal into the book um, takes about eight drafts of every yeah, sentence. Yes. I have to of course. cultivate writing the way I talk. Yeah. Uh, uh, so there's a question. So, uh, right in the middle. Can you write a memoir without hurting those you love? And if so, <coughs> and if so how? Well, I make it a short. My, um, I, 
my published thesis, what uh, Cook Seed is about your experience in, in America, which is about divorce, because it's uh, immigration, and I have to get my husband's, um, my husband's permission. And he, I said, what are we gonna do? Well, are you, are we gonna, I'm gonna change your name? And he says, no, you, I changed my name. What about a child? So my name is Chigu Jiang, you call me Chigu Chen. And, and uh, that doesn't make any sense in real life. Mm -hmm. So I sent him the, uh, the, the manuscript and he, he, he read it and he, he says, great, no change. If you wanna change a word, no book. So he really thought what I wrote was a very balanced point of view. Mm -hmm. So I think when writing a balanced point of view, it gave him the fair, how do you say that? Yeah, uh, yeah. Fair, to fair turns to, uh, to fair turns in the memoir, which is hard to do because I'm I we divorced. We are we are we are we we are enemies in a way in Chinese style. <laughs> I, I made but it's sense. important <laughs> to, to give a balance uh, to you so you don't hurt him. Right. Not only don't hurt me, he embraced it. He said there's no shame to it. It's our immigrant dilemma. I, I made a, a decision when I was going to do this book that I wasn't going to write about the people who are alive who I care about in my life. So the, my, my father is dead, my mother's alive. There's a, a, a lot about my father, very little about my mother. There's very, very little about my partner. And his name isn't even in it. He's in the book, he's C. And, and there's, been, there's been some critique of that. You know, what, and the answer is, well, I'm, I, I, I don't care. Uh, and we choose <laughs> as memoirists what we're gonna put into the world and what we're gonna keep back, as we all do as people in a conversation. Yes. And, um, and I'm keeping some things for myself. And sure. I Thanks, may or may not write about them Thank you so much. I think we're out of time and we've been told to leave. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> I didn't even know what my mother's life, my father said. <laughs> We'd like to thank Angie, Mark, Rigid, Joanna, and Brashrit Peer for a wonderful session. The next session will start at 11.15. We have a 15 minute break. So we'll see you then. And yeah, the book signing, the authors will be available for the book signing. And whoever wants to buy the books, they'll have to buy it from the Amazon store. And then you can have it signed at the book signing counter, which is right here. Thank you.